If you ever saw a desktop display model in a museum, in a movie, or on a TV show between World War II and the 1980s, it was very possibly a topping model. Topping models was begun by Bill Topping in 1942, and its origins lie in a simple comment that he made that took root. According to the Precise Models website on topping models, Edward William Topping was born in 1908 and was raised by his grandparents from age two after his parents were killed in the infamous 1910 Wellington, Washington train avalanche. In 1936, at age 18, his grandparents passed away and he was offered a job as a salesman for the Goodyear Tire Company. The president of the company had been a good friend of Bill's late father and probably wanted to help give the lad a start in life. He turned out to be a pretty good salesman but he loved aircraft and machinery and wanted to be reassigned to the mechanical division, which he was in 1940. When World War II broke out, he asked to be assigned to the Grumman Aircraft Company as a Goodyear representative. While touring the facility one day, he saw a layout of rather unimpressive models of Grumman aircraft on display. He inquired to the Grumman executive how much Grumman paid for these. When he got the answer, he remarked that he could do a better job for less. Nothing happened right away, but the executive made a mental note of the comment. The Grumman exec later gave Topping his first order for 1,500 models. It was probably an order for the new Grumman Hellcat, which was still under development and first flew in 1942. Sources vary, but it appears that this led to Bill starting Topping models, making recognition models for the military during World War II as a part-time job, as he was still a full-time Goodyear employee. During 1942, Topping also started producing props for wire-controlled model airplanes. He later met Leland Harley, who owned a small company called h &P Plastics and flew model airplanes as a hobby. Mr. Hardy suggested having Majestic Molding Company cast the Topping models, and Hardy's company could finish them on contract to Topping. This freed Bill up to focus on sales and bookkeeping. Mr. Hardy also introduced Topping to Joe Goldsmith of Buckeye Molding. Now, this will be important later. Now, sources vary again on whether Topping met Hardy during the war or after the war, but in either case, Mr. Hardy would become integral to Topping's success. Bill Topping developed the technique of injection molding that he most likely learned while he was working with Goodyear's Mechanical Production Division. He then established a working relationship with the aforementioned Joe Goldsmith, who was a die maker and made all of Topping's molds. Just as in the plastic kit model production today, the first step was to make a master model and then send it to the manufacturing engineers for final approval before production runs were approved. In 1945, just after the war, Topping introduced the Topping 100, an aluminum bodied, flying, line controlled kit model that came with everything except the engine and fuel system, or as it was called back then, the wet cell. The cost was $10, which is about $145 converted for modern money. But Topping's business with injection molded models grew, so he sold the propeller business to Mr. Hardy. After the war, Bill resigned as an employee of Goodyear, so Topping models could go full time in 1945, although one source states that it did not actually incorporate until 1950. So the way it initially worked was Bill Topping decided what was to be made and then contracted Joe Goldsmith to make the molds. The molds were sent to the Majestic Molding Company who took those molds and made the raw models. These were then sent to Mr. Hardy's H&P Plastics where they were finished, decaled, and packaged and then Topping sold them. This makes sense as Bill traveled extensively making contact with aircraft manufacturers to make sales. He also traveled in style and often took his wife Evelyn with him, but more on that later. As the business grew, it got too big for H&P Plastics to handle, as they were essentially a cottage industry. So, in 1955, as the company expanded, a second facility called Topping Models Assemblies was founded in Elyria, Ohio, about 50 miles northwest of Akron. Bill had also taken on a partner, Paul Schneider. Bill ran the administrative offices in Akron, and Paul ran the assembly facility in Elyria. Topping was now making its own models, although Mr. Hardy was still involved. He had too much experience to lose. Paul Schneider's son, Gary Schneider, was brought on as a kid to learn the business, which he ended up making a career out of. 
The company was busy making models and Bill was busy selling them. His travels took him to aviation and manufacturing firms across America as well as military bases. Paul often gifted models to executives, contractors, and military officers alike as he knew it would, and usually did, lead to large-scale purchases. Often, it was the contractors such as Boeing or Douglas that bought the models in bulk to gift to military officers and politicians. Now, this was perfectly normal in the 1940s and 50s and even in the 1960s. The profit margin on the models was about 10% and often was little more than 15 cents per unit, so bulk orders and sales in the thousands were essential to keep the doors open. To give an idea of just how thin the numbers could be, according to their ledger sheet for the second quarter of 1958, a $1 model of the Chance Vought Regulus II had only a $0.07 profit margin and only netted the company $104 on a bulk order of 1,500 units for the quarter. Whereas the much more successful Boeing 707 sold 9,000 units that same quarter at $1.35 a piece with a $0.16 profit margin, netting the company $1,440 for the quarter. Some units fared worse, much worse, such as the rather expensive Grumman S2F model, which was actually made and sold at a small loss, with 2,000 units selling at $3 each but costing $3.43 a piece, which resulted in a net loss of $860 for the quarter on that model. But overall, the business did well, very well in fact. Bill and his wife Evelyn were becoming accustomed to a high quality of life that some referred to as being a bit lavish. First class travel, a home in a swanky area, and always a nice car. But the finances were strong and all looked good. Bill made contents with many industries and did not limit himself to aerospace. He was always on the hunt for the next deal and often attended trade shows. Of course, Topping also did commissions, and in 1958, he entered the company into a deal with the Walter J. Hyatt Company of Beverly Hills, California. This gave Topping Models an exclusive representative on the West Coast. He also made a similar arrangement for a representative on the East Coast. 1958 is also when Topping tried to make injected metal models using a zinc alloy. The aircraft chosen was the new Republic F-105B, but it turned out to be a failure. The model, not the F-105B. The models were hard to make and ended up losing the company about $460 on their limited run. In 1960, the entire Topping Models Enterprise was consolidated in the Elyria facility and the Akron office was closed. Things were looking good at Topping and the company flourished. As always, Bill was looking for the next deal when the 1964 World's Fair created a unique opportunity. But unfortunately, this story would turn out to be as much of a cautionary tale as it is a sad one. Topping got the exclusive contract to provide models of the Unisphere Globe for the 1964 World's Fair, but Bill did not see the fine print. Topping's exclusive rights were limited to the American Pavilion inside the fairgrounds. Right outside the American Pavilion, there were countless cheaper and, dare I say, less well-made Unisphere Globes being sold for a fraction of the price. Bill Topping had spent a fortune having thousands of these globes made, but only sold a handful. About the same time as the Unisphere debacle, the government was also passing laws on giving gifts to military personnel and government employees. This crippled the model sales. Combined with Bill's rather affluent lifestyle, it left him loaded down with useless inventory and not much cash. This double whammy had an unrecoverable impact on topping models, which entered voluntary bankruptcy in 1965. Most of its assets were picked up by Precise Model, a company that was not only physically close to topping models, but was started by two former topping employees. Two years later, in 1967, Bill suffered a stroke and took three years to recover. In 1970, he tried to restart topping models, making uh, only a few models, with the main offerings being different versions of the Piper Cherokee series of aircraft. The company never really saw much success, and in 1973, Bill Topping retired. He had always been a model builder and continued to hand make a series of historically specific dioramas, but they too never sold. Bill passed away in 1992, and his wife Evelyn passed in 1998. Topping made about 250 different models 
with about 100 models in the catalog at any given time. Sales numbers were all over the board, with some kits selling in the hundreds and others selling in the tens of thousands, but it's generally held that they produce somewhere over 3 million models in total. Just as kit model molds often get reproduced by subsequent owners, some of Topping's models continue to be made by precise models. Most large aircraft manufacturers had a model shop in-house that could essentially hand make or do limited production runs of display models, but Bill Topping was making them by the thousands. Did you ever own a Topping model? What's your story? Those magnificent men, those magnificent men in the fly. 